Okay, I guess we can start. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, my name is Edson Yanaga. I'm a director of developer experience at Red Hat. My Twitter handle is at Yanaga. And today we're going to talk about uh, migrating to microservices databases, in particular about relational data databases. So it's my first time here in Porto. I enjoyed everything so far, even though it has been just a couple of hours. I had the opportunity to go to Café Santiago and uh, have a francesinha which is really good, by the way. A bit heavy, though. <laughs> okay. And just some curious facts. Uh, I'm a Brazilian Japanese. That's why I speak Portuguese, even though people don't expect me to speak Portuguese here. Okay. I'm also, I also happen to be a Java champion and a Microsoft MVP. And as far as Google can tell me, I'm the first and so far only one. And I'm also at the DevConf Rockstar, which is the largest uh, software developer conference in uh, Latin America. And for today, uh, I hope we can make a, a raffle. So I brought uh, this talk is based on this book, which I uh, published from, um, uh, with O'Reilly, Migrating to Microservice Databases. So everything I'm going to talk with you today, uh, you have everything here in more detail format. So, But if you want a hard copy of the book, uh, here's the deal. You have to go to Twitter, follow me at Yanaga, Take a picture of the session and mention Etianaga and hashtag NDC Porto. If you do that, all of that, I have an application which is open source. It's available on my GitHub, Yanaga. You just have to trust that the version I'm running is the same one that is available on GitHub. OK, but uh, if everything goes fine, I'm just going to pull all of the tweets and randomly pick uh, the five winners that I have for this session. OK? But if you don't. Uh, get the hard copy of the book. Here's the next tip. Red, the Red Hat Developer Program bought the royalties of the electronic version. So if you want to get the PDF, Pub, or Mobi for free, you can go to this URL, bit.ly, mono to micro db, and get the electronic version of this book. Okay? So unfortunately, uh, we only have one hour to be discuss this, this, the, discussing this subject. It's a very extensive uh, s topic. So uh, I'm going to cover, uh, in general terms, what we have on the book. But if you want uh, anything in more detail, you can always go to the, to the uh, full book. And uh, another thing that is important for, for me to answer is that why did I decide to write this book? Uh, I've been discussing microservices for about six to seven years and distributed system for even longer. But uh, when I started the discussion about microservices, uh, everybody was uh, asking me, well, you're talking about microservices. There are many other people that are talking about uh, microservice too. Uh, you have some books, but everybody talks about the behavior part or the architecture part of the microservices architecture. But nobody talks about the, maybe the hardest part, which is the data. How do I deal with distributed data? How do I split? How I integrate later? And to be honest, I didn't have a proper answer for that. So I started this research about four years ago. and. The, the first initial result of my research I was able to publish as a book, and now I'm writing another book about the subject, in particular about uh, not only about relational databases, but distributed data in general and event-driven architecture. I told the editors that I would be finishing by October this year, but as you know, I'm a software developer, so I'm very good in estimates, so I'm not sure if October will be the real deadline. This book, I told the editors that I would be finishing by February, and I finished in December of the next year. Okay, so we might have some delay, but so far everything uh, is is on track because uh, I was writing the book and doing the research uh, at the same time. For this new book, I have all of the content already. I just need to to calm down and sit and and, and write the pages. Okay, and it's going to be a bigger book too. But since we have to discuss the subject, migrating to microservice databases, I'd like to start with zero downtime. When we're talking about DevOps and microservices, of course, if you want to be uh, really able to deploy uh, smaller batch sizes and have more frequent releases into production, we need zero downtime. We're not allowed to just shut down all services because somebody is updating uh, one microservice into production. So if you want to achieve zero downtime in your deployment pipelines, you need the, the, the first and more, uh, the simplest requirements is to have blue-green deployments, 
which means that in your deployment architecture, you need, uh, in your production environment, at least two similar environments, each one of them capable of handling 100% of your requests into production at the same time. And what happens is that you have a blue and green deployment. I want to release a new version and just choose one of the environments, for example, the green. I just release the new version into the green env uh, um, environment. I get the router. I route all of my uh, deployment requests to the green environment. If everything went well, OK, I just can, uh, can just update the blue deployment. Or else I can go, well, something went wrong. Don't worry, I have the previous version still working on the blue um, uh, environment. I just asked the router to switch back the, the, the request to the old version until I figure out what went wrong with the new version. So this is a very safe approach and allow us to perform zero downtime deployments. You just need to take a, a bit of care in what you're doing with your code. But as I said before, code is the easy part. When we're talking about behavior, most people can figure out what do you need to do with your software to have multiple, ver uh, multiple, and when I say multiple, at least two versions running at the same time in production. But when we're talking about states, which is, means the data that is being stored usually in a relational database for enterprise information systems, it's much harder. So how, if you have to change anything in your database, if you're changing the schema of your, of your database, or if you're changing the semantics of the data that is stored in the database, how do you deal with multiple versions running at the same time in production? So uh, one of the, uh, uh, I think one of the greatest uh, results of my research was that Four years ago, I was able to talk with many people, uh, many different people and teams worldwide, trying to figure out how they solve this problem. Even though it was a side effect of my research, uh, I, I have to tell you that it's by far the most popular chapter of my book. How to do this kind of thing, zero downtime deployments with relational databases in production environments. So the question was, how do I do that with relational databases? And the answer goes through, you're not allowed to perform uh, migrations manually anymore. And technically, in the database world, migrations is the set of SQL statements, code statements uh, that you apply to your database to change your database schema version from one version to the other. So uh, usually, it's a lot of SQL statements that you need to apply that. And in the past, we used to just get this SQL statement, a big one, like a 100-line SQL statement, sent to your DBA through email and ask he or she to, well, Whenever I upgrade the version of my artifact in production, you just please apply the SQL statements. Usually they forget. That's why you have problems when you release into production. Well, we can't do that anymore. We need to automate everything. And the two most popular uh, database mi uh, migration tools in the Java world, and uh, because I'm a Java person, but after the research, I just realized that most of the people are using these tools, Flyway and Liquibase. They just, ha just happen to be developing in Java, but they work, of course, in any environment. Uh, they support uh, XML, SQL, uh, even code-based migrations. So they are very flexible. And if you're using Flyway, you can even use Flyway to upgrade uh, the, the, the schema of your uh, SQLite databases and Android devices. So it's a very... Uh, they, they are all very flexible tools. I just note that uh, from my research again, uh, the only uh, developer world where these tools were not as popular as the Java world were the Ruby on Rails world, just because Ruby on Rails has built-in migrations, so they don't need an external tool for that. Okay? So how can we achieve with these tools zero downtime migrations? The answer is we need our migrations to be back and forward compatible, which means that the schema versions of our, our relation database, uh, I have a, uh, the previous version needs to be compatible with the next version, and the new version needs to be compatible with the previous version. How can we achieve that? So instead of issuing 100 line SQL statements to my DBA, I'm going to split that big SQL statements, big file, into smaller uh, files, maybe, even though it's technically possible to have more than one statement per file, uh, if you're start a beginning with this kind of thing, it's better to have like one single statement per migration. It's much easier for you to control. Even though technically, if you're changing different sets of tables at the same time, it could be allowed for you to have like more than one statement per migration. But just uh, leave that to advanced cases. Also, 
If you use it to issue update statements to your database, like if you have a table with one billion, billion rows, and it, that update statement took uh, 30 seconds or five minutes to update, and we, uh, within that time you had like a lock in your uh, table, it would mean downtime into production. You're not allowed to do that anymore, so you need to shard your updates, which is the technical term in the data world to mean that you have to split your update statements into smaller statements until you can measure an appropriate downtime. So you have, if you have a lock of like, 200 milliseconds, and 200 milliseconds is good enough for, use, for your use case, for your use case, you just found the perfect bet size. So you need to shard your updates. And just an example, this one is wrong, but just to tell you what you, what you might need to change. So if you use it to issue uh, an ultra table customer, rename something to other thing, maybe you have to split this statement into multiple smaller ones, like add column, multiple updates, and then maybe later delete them. OK? So this is to give you the overall idea. And I was able to collect. Four, uh, four different scenarios that developers worldwide are using to apply zero downtime migrations. And I'll warn you that most of the time that when people see it for the first time, they say, oh, that is a lot of work just to, just to achieve zero downtime migrations. But everybody that tried to apply the zero uh, downtime migrations in productions, they never looked back uh, after the applying that because this is not the only way to achieve zero downtime migrations. This is the only. Uh, this is the safest way for you to be updating your database schema into production because you never lose the previous data that you were working on because you never issued destructive statements to your production database. That's why people are so uh, excited about using this in production. And again. The first time I presented these migrations to an audience, there were many people in the audience that just uh, raised their hands and told me, I don't think this works. They really like to challenge, especially when people are talking about something new. But even four years after I presented them, I just asked them, well, if you think it doesn't work, I just need one example that doesn't work. It proves that I'm wrong, but I didn't receive any so far. Uh, which might mean that it might be working. But if you want to really check, you can go to my GitHub again. I have a, a repo called Zero Downtime Migrations, where I show uh, an application uh, using different migrations, and I evolve the application through different versions. And you can have two versions running at the same time with different database schemas, and they both work. So you can roll back, you can move forward, and you never lose any data, and your application still behaves correctly. OK, so you can go to the GitHub. But of course, I always ask people to try, because if anything is wrong, I'm the first one to, uh, that wants to learn to, to know if anything really is wrong, so I can fix it. OK, so uh, we're going to uh, discuss very quickly, because I don't have much time to be discussing that. But the scenarios are add a column, rename a column, change in type and format of a column, and delete a column. How does it work? So first scenario, add a column. So you're not allowed to do, uh, do outer table add column anymore. You have to do this, at least these four steps into production. Each one of these numbers, one, two, three, and four, are different versions that we're releasing into production. So on the first release, you just use uh, issue outer table add column. You won't be using the column uh, yet. So second version, your code computes the read value and writes to the new column. When I say compute, if you can compute the value from other fields in your application, you do that, or I also just assume a default value that could mean something to your application. Okay. Uh, third release, which could be multiple ones, like 3, 3.1, 3.2, you update, update the data using shards. Uh, you issue the update statements to update the new column uh, to your database. And number four, code reads and writes from the new column. If you did all of these steps in sequence, uh, and you apply the, that, all of that to your database, you successfully applied a zero downtime migration where each one of these versions is back and forward compatible at the same time. And this is the simplest one. Uh, I have to emphasize that between each one of these versions, each one of these releases, you're going to open your uh, SQL CLI and you are going to uh, uh, issue multiple select statements to your database just to check if your application is writing the right information or if anything went wrong to your migration. Okay? I think somebody raised their hand. Uh, on step four, when you say code reads and writes to the new column, are you talking like uh, non SQL code, like the actual application code? Yes. So let's suppose that in between three and four, someone 
to change the value of the old column. So the new column wouldn't be after that. Yeah, but there is no old column. I'm just adding. No, OK. So yeah. first of all, you add the column, right? On the yeah. Page, No, but there is no old column. There is nothing, and there is the new. Because when you have an old column, it's the next scenario. But I know, uh, and I, uh, uh, I, to be honest, I won't try to think about this complicated scenario while I'm talking, because, of course, I'm nervous and everything. But if you can discuss later, uh, we'll have plenty of time to be discussing that. But thanks for the question. OK? And. Second scenario, this is the most complicated one when I have to rename a column into production. So we need at least six different steps. So first step, alter table, add column. Second version, your code reads from the old column and writes to both. Uh, why do you write to both? Well, you need both versions running at the same time. So uh, third version, you copy the data using small shards. Fourth version, your code reads from the new column and writes to both. Again, you need to write to both because the old version might need to need it, if in, just in case you roll back to. Uh, fifth version, your code reads and writes from the new column. And sixth version, you delete the column, not immediately, but later. And when I mean the sixth step, what do you do? You just leave the column there, uh, and uh, you just open uh, your Jira, uh, create a new ticket saying DBA uh, in your maintenance window, just check if nobody is really using this column, uh, perform a backup, and if you did that, you can successfully really delete the column. And why we just do that later? Because deleting a column is a destructive statement. If you do that, you lose the data, and your previous version won't be able to work with that column anymore. That's why we do that, OK? And next scenario, change type and format of a column. And you can see these are the exactly same steps, which is a good thing. We're always rehearsing the, the same steps to perform this kind of zero downtime migrations. and. Fourth scenario, delete a column, which you never do in production. So why? Because again, deleting a column is a destructive statement. If you delete a column, you just lose everything that you have. Uh, the, only, uh, the only thing that you can do if you delete a column and you need the previous version is to, do to restore a backup, which we, if we, you ever did that into production, can be a very painful thing. I did that, of course, upgraded a version of one software in the weekend. And Monday morning, I just realized that, oh, I, we, well, we screwed up. And I called the DBA. We need to restore the backup from Saturday in the evening. And he just told me that, well, you know that to restore the backup, it takes eight hours, right? So it was a very, very happy day in my life, OK? Uh, uh, so, but, so you never deleted a column, but if you decide to delete a column of production, you just change your code, stop reading the value, but keeping writing to the column because, again, your previous version might need the data. And you might be wondering, what if I remove the field on my application that used to get the value? Well, you just have to figure out and try to write some value on the database that's meaningful to the previous version. Okay? And uh, if you did that, maybe later, when you know that nobody's using that anything anymore, you can stop writing to the column and ask the DBA to delete the column later on the maintenance window. Okay. What about my referential integrity constraints, not new constraints, and other kinds of constraints? The answer, you have to drop them and just recreate everything when the migrations uh, are done. And you might be wondering, well, referential integrity constraints are just a safety net. Because it just, uh, these are just things that the DBA uh, puts on the database to prevent us, application developers, from uh, inserting inconsistent data to the database. So we don't really require them to, for application to be running, even though it's good and in um, most of the cases very cheap for you to implement. So, but in this case, if you're responsible, you're doing the right thing, you don't really need the, um, this stuff working in your production database. And this concludes the part where I talk about zero downtime and migrations. And you might be wondering, why are you talking about that if the subject of this talk is microservices database? Because in the past, the downtime of the system was equal to the downtime of the monolith, which was also equal uh, most, of, most of the times when we're talking about migrations, to the downtime of your database. But if we're talking about microservice database, uh, databases, distributed architectures, 
And, well, you're not allowed to have downtime in your system just because you have one of your multiple, maybe 20 microservices in your architecture, because that microservice is updating their database. So I'm going to have downtime. Then if you're doing that multiple times per day, then the other team is updating the other microservice, and I have downtime. The downtime is just multiplied. So you, you, well, you're not allowed to have downtime, but uh, even, it's even worse if you have a downtime that is preventable, such as downtime from migrations. And now we're going to discuss the microservice characteristics part of this talk. Martin Fowler did a very good, a nice job collecting something and publishing them on his blog. Uh, there are at least nine different characteristics of microservice architectures, but today I'm only going to discuss this one, decentralized data management, which means that if the best practice is to start to always start with a monolith, and then after it grows, you just decide to split that into a microservice architecture. You just decide to pick one part that might be a good bounded context in domain-driven design terminology. You extract that into your microservice. So how can I achieve from the monolith an extraction and achieve the goal of the one database per microservice? Right? If you studied microservice a bit, you know that if you don't have one database per microservice, you basically have a coupling on the data layer, and you have much bigger issues, which I won't be able to discuss today. But this is the basic goal. So one database per microservice, but again, I always start with a monolithic database. And for some, in some ways, I'll need to split, and most importantly, I'll have to integrate the data layer because data has mass, and just like in gravity, the more data you have, the more data it attracts. Uh, because oh, I need to you, you need data correlation in enterprise information systems. Data is never uh, isolated from the other parts of the system, so you need to integrate and make them work together. So splitting is not easy, but how I integrate the data? And even though I can't help you to decide which piece of the data do you want to extract or do you need to extract, because that's a domain model problem, and you really, well, you need to really dig into the mo domain model to be able to extract the, the information that you need. But I can help you on how can you integrate the data after you decided which piece of information do you want to extract from your, from your monolithic database. But before I dig into the answers, I have to explain some concepts very briefly for you. Uh, first of all, some consistency models. I don't know if anybody here studied distributed systems. What I'm going to tell you right now is an oversimplification of the concepts just uh, for teaching purposes. And I'm only going to discuss two different models, strong consistency and eventual consistency, in particular, a subtype of eventual consistency, which is strong eventual consistency, which is different from a sequential eventual consistency, and I'll explain why. Uh, how does it work? In a strong consistency system, if I have like five nodes in my system, and uh, I decided that I have a variable which i equals to three, and I decide to update this variable, I now is equal to five. And of course, in each one of these nodes, I have clients connected to these nodes. In a strong consistent system, which is the system that you believe that you have when you're using uh, database transactions, uh, but again, sorry for lying for you, you don't really have a strong consistency even in your relational database because that's very expensive. But suppose that you, supposing that you would have uh, this kind of thing, in a strong consistent system, when I decide to update a variable, all of the nodes in the system, they need to agree on the new value before anybody reads the new value, okay? So until that information propagates in all of the nodes and everybody agrees on it, everybody is reading the old value. Okay, so it's very similar to what you think that you have in relational databases. And eventual consistency, in a pure eventual consistent system, if you have five nodes, writes are allowed in any node. So if i equals to three, and I decide that, well, here I'm going to update i now equals to five, and at the same time in the other node, uh, somebody's updating i equals to 10. And then when this information propagates, you have a conflict, and the system needs to decide which one is correct which for some use cases might be valid. For enterprise information systems, usually we don't accept this kind of use case. We want the true information. And you might be thinking, well, the last write wins, but if, the, if you're using the last write, it means that you need some kind of synchronized clock, and we learned that we can't rely on synchronized clock unless you're Google. 
Like if you're using some uh, sort of distributed database like Spanner, you might have uh, strong consistency between the, uh, a global distributed network, but just because Google had enough money to launch their own satellite network, and I'm pretty sure that everybody here does have the same amount of money. Okay, but if you don't, you can't rely on global synchronized clock. You need to solve this problem in another way. That's why instead of using pure eventual consistency in distributed in enterprise uh, microservice architectures, we're using another subtype of eventual consistency, which is a strong eventual consistency. How does it work? In this kind of model, you choose one of the nodes to be the canonical source of information. You, in this node, this is the source of the truth, and writes are only allowed on this node. So uh, basically, you choose uh, on this node, now i equals to 5. And this, imp this information gets propagated to the other nodes. And while the other uh, clients connected to the other nodes are still reading the old value, clients connected to this node are, st are already reading the new value. So if I say i equals to 7, other people might be reading like i equals to 5. And if later some, and this information, for example, propagates, now two nodes have 7 and the other three have 5. Then somebody decides to update i equals to 9 on this node. So what happens in this case? Clients connected here are reading a 9. Clients connected to this node are reading a 7, and clients connected to the other nodes are still reading a 5. So what happens in this kind of model? You always have correct data, but the data might be outdated with different latency values. Okay? So this one is fresher, this one is oldest, but all of the data is correct. They just might be outdated with different latency um, uh, times. OK, and why is it different from sequential consistency? Because uh, in, a micro, in, an in an enterprise microservice architecture, the clients are sticky. So you have a database. This microservices, this microservice is always connected to the same database. You don't have microservices hopping nodes from database to perform the readings. So because in a sequential system, you might happen that, oh, I'm reading a 5. Then you connect to the other node. I'm reading a 9. And you might get back to a node value. Okay? But it doesn't happen in enterprise information systems. And that's why we're using strong eventual consistency instead of pure uh, sequential eventual consistency. Okay? So this is the first concept. And have in mind strong eventual consistency, because that's the model that people are using worldwide to um, in enterprise information systems for microservice architectures. Second concept, CRUD and SecureS. We're going to uh, learn the difference between them. CRUD is an architecture, a very simple and common architecture, where all of the four operations, create, read, update, and delete, which means the write and read information, are performed using the same domain model. Uh, what does it mean? If I have a, a customer microservice, I have a customer class in my domain model, and I have a customer table in my database and its dependencies. If I want to write something to the database using an, an uh, ORM, I just create a new instance of customer, I populate the value, ask the, the ORM to, to save it to the database. If I want to query the information, I just create a query, I retrieve customer objects from my database and, ex, um, and expose it to the user. So CRUD, very simple, recommended for like 90% of the use cases. It's so simple that these days, uh, our tools, we have tools to automatically generate the code. It just, you just give a domain model, it automatically scaffolds everything for you and exposes you in a beautiful REST API or even creates a beautiful interface for you. So this is uh, the model that was particularly popularized in the 90s and the 2000s. So, and uh, if you think that about traditional enterprise information systems, uh, we had a certain proliferation of this kind of model because it allows, well, a uh, uh, workflow where you have different uh, kinds of CRUDs, uh, screens, where the user needs to input the devices, but the process to achieve a, a business goal is external to the two. So if you're using like, um, tools like SAP or anything else that you have a lot of CRUDs to be filling up, uh, to achieve a certain go business goal, you just have to go to this form, fill it, you go to other form, you just send your value, you go to another form, just fill something, go to the other form, just fill something. Uh, the process is external to the two, which is very nice because it makes the two very flexible. You can adjust your, you can use the two for many different process. It's very nice because consultants can charge you a lot because they have to teach you the process because it's external to the two. 
And it worked very well. The problem is that with digital transformation these days, uh, you need to be much more efficient in certain processes. So you're doing less things, but the things that you're doing, you need to be extremely efficient. So this kind of architecture might not be the, the, the right one for certain use cases in your business domain. Uh, and for, the, for this particular case, you might want a richer domain model. And some of the patterns that you might need to apply when you're doing that is, for example, SecureOS. I was reading uh, SecureOS. The name was coined approximately 12 years ago by Greg Young. Uh, he didn't create the, this pattern. He just created the name. And, and I was rereading his uh, published documents uh, about the reasonings uh, behind uh, this pattern. And SecureOS is a very fancy name for another simple architecture, Command Query Responsibility Segregation, which started, which derived from CQS, Command Query Separation, which was first published by Bertrand Meyer in his AFIL book. What Bertrand Meyer told us is what that, well, if you have, you need to separate your interfaces between command operations and query operations. So if you're talking about Java or C Sharp, you're just creating a Java or C Sharp interface for write operations and read operations. And we didn't know exactly why at the time, almost 30 years ago. But these days, we learned that, oh, if you have different um, interfaces, now it's very easy for you to use different technologies for reading and writing. You just need to switch the implementation for the write interface, for example, and you have a different writing uh, write technology. Uh, so if you did everything correctly in your legacy system, it might be easier for you to be doing today. Okay? And command key responsibility segregation is an evolution of the CQS. Again, it's really recommended that you have separate service interfaces. But if you didn't do that, don't worry, you can still have a CQS uh, pattern implemented in your architecture. How does it work? And I'm pretty sure that most of you already used and created a SecureOS architecture. You just didn't know that it, have this, it had this name. So if you have a, a SecureOS uh, pattern in your architecture, you basically customer again. If I want to write things to the, to the database, I just create a customer instance and write the customer to the customer tables. But somebody requires from me a report. And on this report, I just want the ID, the name, and the phone number of the customer. But the customer table is very big, has a lot of fields. Uh, if I just decide to use a CRUD, I'm going to query the entire database into memory to just to, to generate a report with three fields. So what do you do? You create a custom query. Select ID, name, and phone number from customer, and you, you, uh, you populate these things in a customer DTO, and you use this DTO in memory to generate your reports. Congratulations, you created the simplest possible form of secure S architecture. You're using different domain models, customer class to write, and using customer DTO to read. And you are correct, the reason that we did that in the past was, number one, performance. Using CRUD for some use cases is too slow and consumes too memory. So we needed to use SecureOS to improve the performance of our system. But these days, when we're talking about distributed data, we are using secure, the SecureOS pattern to solve other kinds of problems that are performance again, but we have other um, requirements to be uh, solved too. So, uh, and this is the most basic implementation. But this is the most interesting one for distributed data. A secure S with separate data stores. And if you ever created a view in your database and you issued queries against that view, you created a secure S, uh, uh, you implemented the secure S pattern in your architecture with separate write and data stores. Because customer is still populated and being written on the write data store, but when you need to query something, you created a separate data store, a customer view, and you're retrieving your customer DTOs to, uh, from your read data store, which is the customer view. That's a secure S architecture with separate data stores. And in the previous example, where I needed the report with just ID, name, and phone number, if I needed another report with ID, name, name and email, what would I do? I would create another custom query, select ID, name, and email from customer. I would create another DTO, very likely customer DTO2, even though we know it's a terrible name. And we, use that, we would use that DTO to generate our reports. 
So you realize that usually in this pattern, you have one single write model, customer class, but you might have multiple read models depending on the requirements of your system. Okay? So write is usually one, but uh, read data stores or read, da read domain models can be multiple in your system. Okay? Keep in mind, as I said, strong eventual consistency is the model that we're using, and CQRS with separate data stores is the pattern that we're going to apply to our microservice architecture. This is what people are using worldwide. And last but not least, I have to discuss a bit about CQRS and event sourcing. And if you look at the Greg Young docs, you learn that CQRS was created because of event sourcing. Event sourcing is a very old uh, architecture, but uh, the term, again, is not that uh, old. It might be, have been coined like 15 or 20 years ago at most. Uh, but it's a very old concept. It just we, People didn't use this name. So what happened in the 2000s? Uh, people were uh, thinking about uh, the traditional model of storing data into a database, which was, I only store the current state of my data. So if I have a customer, if I query the database, what do I know about the customer? I know the current data. I don't know the past data from the customer. So what was the address 10 years ago of that customer? I have no idea. Okay, because I own, I'm only storing the current data in my, in my database. And this is a traditional way of thinking, and again, it works really well. But 15 years ago, maybe 20, people decided, oh, we have this thing called event sourcing. And the definition of event sourcing is that the state of the data is not a snapshot in my database. The state of the data is a stream of events. And if you ever worked on the bank system, the classic example of event sourcing works like this. If I have a bank system, I have want to know how much money I have in my bank account, I don't store the amount of money in a table and a column and row in my database. What do I do? I create a transaction table, and I just keep writing debit and credit operations. And you have the benefit of this kind of debit and credit, which is sum and subtract. These operations are CRDT, which means that you have conflict-free resolution data types. Doesn't matter the order in which you apply the operations, the result is always the same. So if everybody starts with a zero amount of money, uh, if the order doesn't matter, which mean, it means that the clock doesn't matter, you can later add a transaction that was late and it, you still have the correct value, okay? So if everybody starts with zero, and I just keep uh, adding and subtracting, adding and subtracting, debits and credits, debits and credits, you compute how much money do you have in your bank account? Well, zero. Must, uh, plus, minus, plus, minus, you know how much money do you have in your bank account. Benefits of this architecture. You have very fast writes because you, you, for the write data store, you can use a, a database that is an append-only file system. It's very performant for writes. Uh, on the other hand, you have a free auditing logging because if you know uh, how did you reach that value, you just look at the transaction log, you can figure out, you can just calculate all, uh, everything over again. You have a free time machine. If you want to learn how was the state of your bank account five years ago, six months, two days, and three hours, uh, you just start from zero and apply all of the transactions until that point of time. Okay, so it's a free time machine. On the other hand, you might be wondering to read the data is extremely slow. I have to start from zero and apply all of the transactions over again to know how much money do I have in my bank account now. And it gets even slower the more bank accounts that you have and the more transactions that you have. So this is the scenario. 15 years ago, people were thinking about transitioning from snapshot systems to event source systems, but they had this problem with performance. Then Greg Young coined the term secure S, which we're now tying Secure S architectures, secure S read data stores with event sourcing. So the writes are still event sourcing, uh, uh, sourced. We are getting the writes into an append only file system or a database or something. And synchronously or asynchronously, we create another table with another column with other rows which are updated with a cache information. Okay? So the writes go to this data store, but the reads come from here. And again, you might be thinking, well, the cache might get wrong eventually. But since you're using event sourcing, if you want to do that, and that's what every banking system does during the night, uh, you just get a snapshot from the, how much money you had in your bank account yesterday. You apply 
all of the transactions from the day again, and you just check, well, does the cache have the same value as the computed value from now? If it matches, OK, next, uh, next row. If it doesn't, then somebody raises a flag. Oh, somebody need to, needs to manually check this bank account because something seems wrong. That's the auditing procedure that banks use uh, uh, overnight every single day. So that's how you're tying SecureOS with open sourcing. So you can have very fast writes and an audit trail and a time machine, and you can still have good performance using SecureOS read data models. Okay? Just have in mind, again, Many people are using this kind of architecture in distributed data architectures, not everybody. Okay? So you might be wondering event sourcing or not. But SecureS, definitely, uh, if you're using an enterprise information system, you're very likely to end up using a SecureS read data store. And why did I tell all that? Because uh, after all of these years uh, developing and talking to people that were creating these distributed architectures, the traditional path that most people use to fail when uh, deploying distributed data is this one. Well, I have a monolith. I decided that I want to extract this piece of information. For example, again, customer. Customer, I extract that to a customer microservice. Now I have a, a customer microservice on the customer data. The rest of the monolith still needs the customer data. Uh, so what do you do? Well, we did everything right, so all of the customer data is accessed for from the a customer DAO. So what do I need to do? Well, I just create a REST endpoint here through HTTP. I just, whenever I need the customer data, I just issue remote calls to my remote endpoint and get the data back. So in theory, it should work. You deploy that in production, you fail miserably because it doesn't scale. So if you have, unless you have a very low requirement on reads and writes, this architecture will fail. And I've witnessed that uh, many times in the past years. So when and you just, oh my god, it doesn't scale because it's like many orders of magnitudes lower. So what do we do? Developers, they tend to think like, well, it's slow. We have a performance problem. How do you solve a performance problem for data? You add a cache, right? You just, oh, we're just going to add an internal memory cache in my application. And now every time, well, we, we lower the workload because we have the data locally and everything else. Now you have even more problems of consistency. but Performance gets better, but if it's faster, but it's not fast enough, what do you think? Next step, my cache is not big enough. What do you do? Oh, I need an external cache. So you deploy an external cache system connected to the monolith to store all of the reads, and now performance seems OK. But then you realize, well, uh, I have like a 1,000 reports in my monolith, and I used to do the join of the customer information directly from the database. And since everything is written to SQL strings, it's not type safe. You never know that it's going to happen. Well, not really. But you, you usually, you, you only learn that people are using this data when you run into production, uh, because again, it's string-based programming. And now you have a problem. We are going to need to rewrite all of my reports or any other query that uses customer. And, but almost all the data is in the database using relational uh, tables. And I have objects in my cache. So I used to do the joins in the database. Now I have to query the data and do the join in memory just to generate the reports. Then somebody, usually the most experienced person, has an, has a, uh, has an idea. Why don't we just create a copy table which had the exactly same structure as before? And we just find a way to get the writes that are being written in the other endpoints to get synchronized to our local copy of the data. Well, congratulations. What did you just do? You created a secure S read data model that is using strong eventual consistency to get updated. Now I'm going to just explain to you what are the different techniques that you can use to apply to update the remote data into your secure S read data store. And again, before somebody asks me, I'm going to tell you, I'm describing the particular use case of enterprise information systems. Because I believe that in the software development world, uh, we have some kind of separation between the problems that we solve. Enterprise information systems, you have very complex business logic and uh, complex relations between the data that you're manipulating, OK? But the volume of the data that you're manipulating is not that huge.
compared to most startup, startup business models, where you have simpler business models, but the amount of data that you need to handle is much bigger. So the focus here is, the problem is business model. The other kind of uh, uh, software that you're modeling, the problem here is infrastructure. Okay? So we tackle these different uh, problems with different solutions. I'm going to discuss just the enterprise information problem because I believe that's where like 90% of the developers worldwide um, are, 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 are coding. Okay, so in my initial, initial research, I was able to gather nine different techniques that people were using worldwide. Some of them I don't agree, but I'm not judging. I'm just reporting what people used and seem to be working for them. Okay, and these are shared tables, database views, materialized views, triggers, transactional codes, ETL, data virtualization, event sourcing, and change data captures. And we'll go, we're going to run very quickly through them. And again, everything I'm, I'm saying to you today, you can read in my book in much more detail and in a much better pace, I'm pretty sure. So, shared tables means, means that microservice and monolith are reading and writing from the same tables in the same database. I, I consider this one a hack. Of course, I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it. it's an anti-pattern, but it's very fast integrate. Like I need something deployed today. Well, you, you don't change anything. Just read and write from the same database. You have strong consistency because you're using database transactions in the same database, and it has low cohesion and high coupling. What's the problem with this one? Is the uh, mo monolith and microservice are different teams, and this becomes the perfect excuse for not changing anything at all anymore. Microservice team says, I can't change the database because the monolith is using that. Monolith team says, I can't change the database because microservice team is doing that. So you're just stuck in this thing forever. So if you decide to use shared tables as an integration technology, you just say, well, we're deploying this today. First thing for the next back backlog is we're going to choose a, no a better integration strategy for our data. Uh, you need to ch change th this immediately, immediately or it will get stuck forever. Okay. Second integration, database views. And when I say in separate databases, I know, again, for enterprise information systems, it's not, like, it's not something real uh, to ask for, oh, I need a separate, separate Oracle instance for each one of my microservices, OK? It's going to be a very expensive bill. So when I say separate database, it might mean that, well, you have a, a single uh, database instance running, and you have separate schemas with separate users and permissions for each one of your microservices. That's, that, that, that's a nice approach, a nice and reliable approach, which also means that if you have this kind of centralized infrastructure, even though uh, you might be thinking, well, availability, availability might suffer because I have a single instance, but in, in the other hand, for IT, you have centralized backups and everything else. And let's be honest. If your central Oracle database goes down, do you think really that any part of your system will still keep working in enterprise information world? I don't think so, OK? So that's why uh, even when we say one database per microservice, you can have like different schemas on the same instance. Many people are doing that, and it's not a, uh, 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 an unforgivable thing. Database view. Uh, if I have microservice tables here, I create a view on the other database for the monolith to keep working. Uh, that's the easiest one to implement. Uh, all of the DBMS vendors uh, currently support views. You might have some performance issues depending on the view, depends on the database and how you create everything. You always have strong consistency because you're writing directly to the hot data and the information is always fresh. One database must be reachable by the other, which means that if you have remote instances or separate instances on Oracle, you need to use DBLinks. And some DBAs curse me for that because they say it doesn't work. I'm not judging. I'm just saying that some people are using, and for their requirements, it worked. So you shouldn't be discarding some solutions just because uh, some people say, oh, it won't work. Well, depending on the, your requirements, it might work. Okay. It's updatable depending on the MMS support, because in Oracle you might have updatable views. But we don't recommend that, because it's, if you allow writes in more than one system, you don't have a single canonical node. And it will be very difficult for you for, to change your architecture later if you decide to, to allow updates in multiple nodes. Database materialized view. If you have a performance issue with views, usually the next step is to, uh, to 
uh, change the view to a materialized view. So you have usually have better performance. You might have stronger eventual consistency. If you decide to update the materialized view on commit, you have a strong consistency. But be careful. It's a performance killer. Uh, the most common way is to have a cron trigger updating the, uh, the, the materialized view, or, you, or you else you do a refresh on demand in your system. One database must be reachable by the other. If you're using Oracle, means a DB link. And I use this integration strategy myself uh, in the past, like five, six years ago. We had a particular use case. The customer had a database in their data center. They needed to expose a piece of information into a service on the cloud. So what we created, we went to Amazon RDS. We created an Oracle instance, exactly the same version as they had in the data center. And we kept discussing the entire day how we were going to integrate the data. And then in the end of the day, I just said to them, well, why don't we create a remote materialized view? Everybody left. They cursed me. But when I arrived home, I said, I want to try. You see if it works. So uh, it took me 15 minutes to create a, a DB link and a database materialized view. I tested that. We were using the refresh on demand. And I just put a cron trigger to refresh that every 30 minutes because the requirements of the systems were that the data, the latency for the data updates were 30 minutes. So I was allowed to have a 30 minute delay. So I put a cron trigger on my system to refresh the materialized view for every 30 minutes. And it worked because the refresh took 20 minutes to be completed. I still had 10 minutes left. So even though most, if not all, of the DBA said it was a pretty hack, it worked. And it has been working the past five or six years uh, very well. So uh, that's uh, another option. I'm not judging, yeah, uh, especially because I did this myself. But and again, it's updatable depending on DBMS support. You can also use triggers. Have Microsoft database. You put a trigger on the database every time any, uh, anything is changed. You update the remote endpoint. You have strong consistency if you do that on commit. One database must be reachable by the other because it means you. Again, you can use a DB link. But this one, again, I consider this to be a hack, but I'm not judging. It only works for point-to-point -point integration. Like, I have one microservice, one other endpoint. One microservice, one monolith. And why is that? Because you have tight coupling between the points. Every time you change here, you have to change the other side. Every time you change this side, you need to change the trigger. So it doesn't scale. It works only if you have one or two integrations. Okay, but. If that's the use case of your team, maybe that's a reasonable solution. Transaction code is the same case as trigger, but instead of using triggers, you might be using store procedures or distributed trans transactions, uh, XA or two-phase commit. And uh, you also have strong consistency. You have possible cohesion and company uh, issues, because again, only really works for point-to-point -point integration. You might have performance issues. It's updatable, even though we don't recommend. How does it work? I have a distributed transaction. If I decided to integrate every time somebody changes here, I need to change here, 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 and here. Well, it's a cascading change. If I change here, I have to change here. If I, if I change here, I have to change everywhere. So again, it doesn't scale. It's only feasible for point-to-point -point integrations. ETL tools. If you ever use it, ClinkView, Pentaho, Dash Builder to be creating your reports, you can also use these tools to extract the data from a remote database and create a secure S read data model in your local database. These tools, you have lots of different tools to be able to, that are able to do that. Requires an external trigger, which is usually a con trigger or a button on the interface. You can aggregate multiple data sources. It's always eventual consistent because by the time you read it, it's already outdated. It's a read-only integration, which is not a bad thing. Um, who did that? Well, there were some teams where they, they already had a person that was responsible for the ETL2. They were performing multiple integrations for multiple different kinds of reports every day. And it was their very first integration. I just need to consume that data. Why are we going to waste like maybe a sprint, a week or two weeks, be creating this architecture to propagate the things? Now I need a broker or other, uh, other kind of stuff to be propagating the data. Did you just ask the DTL guy? Well, it's just another query that I have to put in my tool that will get the, data, the, the copy of the data for you. So if you already have an ETL person in your team, maybe that's a reasonable uh, solution. Of course, you have 
more integrations than, than a couple, or if your integration get, need, needs to spend multiple endpoints or you need more complex integrations, ETLs are not feasible. But again, in some use cases, people use ETL tools, and it works for them. Data virtualization, this one is a very nice solution, even though I only met three different teams that used data virtualization solutions. All of them were banks. Two of them were using the Red Hat data virtualization product, and the other one was using the Cisco solution for data virtualization. How does it work? None of them bought the solution just to deploy microservices, but all of them were very happy that they already had the two, and they were, that they were able to use it to create their microservice architecture. Because, because why is that? Because they were able to fail, uh, throw everything up, uh, out, and build everything from scratch again without changing the physical database. Because if you think that splitting a database is hard, splitting it right, it's almost impossible on the same time, uh, first time. Usually you're going to do something wrong, and they, then maybe you have the wish to put things back, and it's even more complicated. Okay? So what did they do? If you use a database uh, data virtualization, basically you, you just have the data in the bottom layer, you, use, uh, you create virtual databases, and you, have, you can have multiple clients consuming the virtual databases. And you might have real-time access, because it's just a virtualization layer. You have performance issues. You can add a cache layer. Here, these tools, they all uh, provide support for caching. And it's, you can have a right uh, integration, even though we don't recommend that. And how did they do that? Well, I want to know which piece of information I can extract from my monolith. If I'm using a virtualization solution, I just, create, uh, I just can create like a virtual database, a customer virtual database, and play with the microservice. Oh, we did it wrong. It's the wrong piece of information to extract because one pattern. Every time I change data here, I need to change it there. Every time I change, change, uh, change data there, I need to change it here too, which means that you probably uh, extracted the wrong piece of information. Oh, uh, yeah, maybe uh, we need to extract it differently or a different model. Then if you're using physical databases, it's going to be very complicated. If you're using a VDB, delete the VDB and create another one. Okay? So they, they were able to do the trial and error with their database until they got the right solution. And that's, that's the examples that I have to give you, only three user cases. And at least one of them, they just decided, well, the VDB solution for the SecureS model is working so well. I think we will stick to the virtual, virtualized solution instead of creating another uh, piece of architecture just to integrate the data. Event sourcing is the architecture that I explained before. The state of the data is a stream of events. You have auditing, time machine, eventual consistency, because usually you're updating the data asynchronously using a message bus. And because of the message bus, you can achieve usually much higher scalability than you, rather than using um, a synchronous requests. And the problem with event sourcing, even though I, I told you the benefits before, the problem with event sourcing that I've seen in the field is that many people are selling event sourcing as the best possible solution for integration between distributed systems. And I think I might agree that event sourcing for many use cases might be the ideal solution. But it's very hard to achieve this ideal architecture in your system. The problem that I witnessed that is that it's very hard for you to do event sourcing right. In fact, I only know one team that did it right on the first time, and that's just because they were uh, fine. I, don't know, uh, I can't disclose the name of the company, but it's a worldwide finance company, but it's not a bank. And they did that. They had a monolith in a mainframe, and they just decided to create a microservice architecture with event sourcing on Amazon and using SQS and everything else. And they did the events right on the first time just because the events didn't change in the past 40 years. So they took the same team. Some people were very old. And they said, oh, we're going to model the new events. And they just had everything by the, in, their, in their hearts. They could say, what types of the events do you have in your system? They just knew it by heart. So it was very easy for them to implement this, this event sourcing because they had uh, all of the events in their minds, and they created everything. But so uh, what's the problem? If you have a legacy system, uh, which is doing snapshotting. I don't recommend you to change the legacy system to create event sourcing because event sourcing is very hard. But if you're creating a new piece of software in your system 
And then you might want to consider event sourcing because that's a really nice, uh, real, real nice solution, especially for greenfield projects. And if you're doing that, what I do recommend is that stick to low-level events on your event sourcing. We, uh, what are low-level events? Create, update, delete, and stick to that. Because uh, usually you have fewer changes if you stick to this kind of events. You just have change of type. You don't have change of semantics. Because people think that, oh, I'm using events and I'm using a broker. I have local coupling in my system. In an event-driven architecture, the coupling in your system is the type and semantics of the events. Every time you change the type, every time you change the semantics, you have, you have a cascading change. You have to change all of the endpoints that are consuming the events. And it gets really complicated if you have multiple endpoints and you're changing the events frequently. So it's even worse than, a, than using a monolith. Because in a monolith, you have, if you're using a type-safe language like Java or C-sharp, you can just refactor the code. If you're using the events, you don't have this. You have to go through multiple code bases and just uh, realize wh what changes between the events. So I'm recommending what? Low-level events instead of domain-level events. Domain-level events give you power because you have semantics. Instead of just created, updated, deleted, you have like, uh, how do I say, um, uh, um, credit limits uh, overflow, well, something like that. Like, you use it too much credit, or uh, yeah, you add this kind of, of semantics, or you ask it in order to be shipped to an address that is not covered by your provider. That's an, another kind of uh, uh, semantics that you can add. But again, if you don't know the types of events that you have in your system very well, you get issues maintaining this code. The last one, because I'm over time, is change data capture, which I only learned it because of the, my research. Uh, if you have a legacy system, you don't want to change the source code, or you, even you don't have the source code of the system, or you're using data integration in your system, which, have, which means that you have multiple applications changing the database directly on the same tables and the same uh, columns. You don't have an, a point in your system when you can just capture all of the change uh, or all of the data change and, and just broadcast the changes. So you have to connect directly into the database transaction log. CDC2s connect to the database transaction logs, reads that information, and propagates that to a message bus. If you ever use Oracle Golden Gate, Golden Gate does a lot of things, including CDC. But the thing that I want to show you is this open source CDC2, Debezium. If you're wondering what is the name Debezium, Debezium, the Red Hat engineers are very good in naming things. So they start with DB, and they wanted it to sound like uh, chemical elements. So they are Debezium. And, well, ended up. I know. Yeah, they're not good. Uh, and how does it work? Uh, very quickly, let me see if I can show you in 30 seconds. What do I have here? I have it running in my machine. I have a, a MySQL database. I have Kafka, uh, which is a very nice message broker. The advantage is that uh, Kafka maintains the order on the same partition. You have a Zookeeper, which uh, stores the shared state. I have a MySQL client. I have Debezium running. I have a Kafka watcher, which just captures the messages on the Kafka bus and prints it to me. Let's see. I have a customer. Have this uh, idea 1004 is and crash smart. If I get here and decide to do an update, I say that updated. Now her name is Anne Marie. And let's see what happened in the Kafka bus. Debezium uh, detected on the uh, transaction log and printed this message on the Kafka bus. Ooh, oops, I got the quotes wrong. So what happened? Debezium propagates for me the schema before and after the operation because it could have been an outer table statement. But since it's an update statement, the interesting part is like before. The operation, the payload was this, first name was N, and the after is N Mahi. And the operation is an update. And you have this some um, uh, sort of internal information and the timestamp. So if you're using this kind of message to, to update the data on your remote secure S read data store, I think it's very easy for you to see, oh, I can get the data, future transform, and just update the data on my local database with this kind of information. Okay, and I have much more that the division can do, but I'm, I'm over time.
And that's what I wanted to share with you today. I hope it's helpful, and thank you very much.